Uh, today's presentation is the 19th century country doctor. Our presenter is Dr. Todd Savitt, PhD, professor in bioethics and interdisciplinary studies. He has been at ECU for about 31 years. So here is Todd Savitt to speak on the 19th century country doctor. Thanks, Melissa. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the country doctor in the 19th century. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the 20th century as well. In fact, I'm gonna start off with a little bit about the 20th century, and then I'll end with some uh, thoughts about the early 20th century, and then I'll finally end by asking you folks your thoughts about country doctors and your experience. Valney Steele is a uh, pathologist, lives in Bozeman, Montana. Um, I, I've known him for a number of years. Uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, be a participant in a, a medical history conference in Bozeman each year. Uh, he's very interested in the history of medicine and uh, wrote this book called Bleed, Blister, and Purge, A History of Medicine on the American Frontier. A lot of what he says in here could apply to the country doctor of uh, the 19th century and, and earlier. Uh, the book, I believe, is still on sale at the Country Doctor Museum here in, uh, well, over in Bailey. So if anybody's interested, uh, this is a good, a good read. It's easy to romanticize the country doctor. We all have images of that doctor, either images like the one on the screen or or this one, or maybe images in our heads from our own experiences with uh, either country doctors or family doctors who came to visit the home, or uh, sometimes general internists were also, uh, well, they were before the days when there was an official family doctor uh, as a designated specialty. Most of the country docs were general internists. I'm going to start with a series of pictures that were taken in 1948 by Eugene Smith, who was a photographer and then later a jazz aficionado and had a place in New York City in Manhattan where uh, jazz greats would come and uh, play just jam uh, of an evening. I learned that uh, several years ago on, uh, listening to an NPR show, I can't remember, but I was very surprised because I only knew Eugene Smith as this photographer. Uh, photographer for a number of magazines. Uh, this one appeared in Life magazine. And it's a, a photo essay of this man, Ernest Siriani, C-E-R-I-A-N-I. -I. I think it's pronounced Siriani who was a country doctor in Kremling, Colorado. Uh, Kremling, K-R-E-M-M-L-I-N-G. Still around, uh, have a few more doctors now. At the time, in 1948, he was just a couple of years out of his residency in, I believe, Denver, and had accepted the appointment at this uh, no-doctor town that had a, a small health center uh, and was looking for a physician. Smith was, I'm not sure how it came about, but he was given the opportunity to follow uh, Dr. Siriani around. He spent 23 days with Dr. Siriani and took this marvelous series. There are 39 pictures. I'm not going to show all of them to you, but uh, I'll show you some of the more uh, interesting ones. Uh, the series became an instant classic and it, it kind of romanticized, and yet it de-romanticized the country doctor and portrayed the country doctor in the 1940s as a dying breed. It showed the good and the difficult aspects of his life. So this will give you a sense of uh, Dr. Siriani. So, an example, now this is an example, you, the, you won't be able to read the text, 
and the, the photos are not high quality for this part. But if you notice on the left, he's in a what looks like a mining car going somewhere. He was uh, headed for a, what he thought was going to be a day of fishing. And uh, you see him in the middle picture there fishing. And then in the middle of the afternoon, he got these uh, miners came and got him because there had been an accident. And he had to go back and take care of this little girl who you see here in the right hand photo. You see mom and dad in that bottom left photo. This little girl was uh, kicked by a horse somehow. And um, she, he did what he could in this small town. You can see the stitches over her eye. Um, but he, according to the article, he knew that when he sent her on to Denver for uh, full care, he was doing more or less what he could, that he knew that they would have to remove her eye, enucleate her, her one eye. So kind of shows the limitations both of uh, the, what could be done in a small town and maybe what could be done, well, yeah, what could be done to repair an eye at that time in the 1940s. But you can see the quality of the pictures, the, the way uh, Eugene Smith captured the uh, tension and the excitement and the sadness in, in just these couple of pictures here. And here's another series of pictures of a, a, an older man who was dying and he wound up, uh, he meaning Dr. Sirianni, wound up taking care of him as he died. And you see the police chief there helping out. Uh, I don't know that there's that much of, more of a story here, but it just gives you again another image of this country doctor. On the top left is a picture, I guess it's clear, yeah, you can see it, of Kremlin in 1948. And purportedly, this picture on the bottom left shows Dr. Kremlin at his leisure with his family. Uh, that's his wife and his two sons. Uh, st standing there. So this is uh, a day of, of relaxation with the family. And the hospital is the picture on the lower right there. The picture of him standing there in his whites with a cup of coffee is him after he had lost a patient, uh, a young woman who died and so did her. She was pregnant and she lost the baby as well. And uh, he's whatever, contemplating, feeling badly. So now these are better pictures. These are uh, quality pictures, these next ones. They're not taken from the magazine. They were in the series, but um, they were somehow pulled out. And maybe these are uh, taken from the negatives. So and it, this is that old man. He's still alive in this picture, by the way. He doesn't look it, but he is. This has a little story to it. This is a, uh, the guy on the stretcher, stretcher is a, a teenager who uh, got drunk uh, and went to a rodeo in a nearby town and uh, fell off. He was on a bron bronco and fell off the horse and uh, injured his elbow, broke, essentially broke his elbow. And you see here Dr. Sirianni uh, carrying half the stretcher and another man carrying, and they're going to the health center, the health. And here's that boy. You see mom there. You can't see dad's face, but you can see the tension. Uh, and there is Dr. Sirianni taking care of the, el the uh, uh, elbow there. And here you can see. Um, He's, there's an assistant there, and somebody is, uh, I guess, another assistant holding some kind of uh, anesthetic over the boy's face. He got a bit uh, out of it, and he said, even though his, he didn't know his mom was standing there, and according to the article, it says, uh, he said, don't tell my mom what happened. No comment, no, nothing to say about that. It's pretty self-explanatory. 
uh, except for the cigarette in the Dr. Sirianni's mouth, <laughs> in the sick room. <laughs> Great picture. No story with this one. It just says a, 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 a patient of his. And you can see him listening. This is these couple of pictures here are really you can see how this boy is just wincing and not looking forward to this. And then he looks. He wants to see. Rain and shine, doesn't matter, you're still out there. This was a tourist who was uh, traveling through Kremlin and had, I don't know what exactly the problem was, but she had some kind of an emergency situation. And so he, Dr. Uh, Siriani is taking care of her. Looking at an x-ray. Laboratory. A one-man operation, clearly, with some help from assistants. Delivery of a baby. It's not as clear here, so I have to look sometimes. That's a great picture. And then family life with his two kids and his wife. He practiced in Kremlin uh, for the remainder of his career. Uh, retired in 1986, so 1948 to 1986. And right after he retired, he was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. Um, sadly, um, so he died in 1988, so two years or less after he retired. Uh, I'm sure anticipating that he would have some time to, to be uh, enjoying his life. That's not to say he didn't enjoy being a physician and the life that that brought, but... And then three years later in 1991, his wife died of a stroke. One of his sons, I'm not sure which one there, became an orthopedic surgeon who's now retired, and the other son is an attorney in Denver. So both the kids grew up um, and as often happens in medical families, the, the physician member of the family isn't always around as, as much as he or she would like. So, just a kind of introduction to the 20th century, or mid-20th century country doctor. They were still around then. As you probably know, the Brody School of Medicine owns the Country Doctor Museum that many of you have passed by and said, I really need to stop there and Am I, how many of you have not been there? Yeah, okay. Stop. <laughs> if you get a chance, stop there and, and go through the museum. It's really neat and interesting. It has some great artifacts and the docents tell a good story. So uh, do go there. There's a picture of it. The, the main buildings are these two uh, doctor's offices from the 19th century that were um, moved from their towns outside of Bailey into Bailey and put together like that. So being a country doctor was, is hard work, like being a solo practitioner like the, Dr. Sirianni. Um, I'm going to talk today about a uh, country doctor from before Dr. Sirianni's time. Uh, and fill in some of the realities that 19th and early 20th century country doctors lived, the kind of world that they lived in. I'm going to begin in horse and buggy days, let's say 100 years before Dr. Sirianni. So 1848, since he started in 1948. Um, and you're a physician in Pitt County, so just imagine yourself a physician in... Pitt County. Where did you live? I'm asking. Idaho. Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> Not in North no, where did where in, in Pitt County would you live? Where biggest city. 
the biggest city. So one, oper one possibility is to live in Greenville, okay? the, county seat. the county seat. Um, why might you not live in Greenville? The people that you would need to serve would probably be on the outskirts out in the residential areas. Okay, so people that you serve might not live right in Greenville. They might live out in uh, actually farm, farm uh, yeah, farm areas rather than uh, there's no suburbs back then. Um, and you may not earn enough money as a physician to support yourself as a physician. And so you might want to or need to own some land and do some farming. So that's a possibility. So somebody gets sick, 1848, Pitt County. So put yourself in the sick person's position for a minute. What do you do when you feel sick in 1848 and you wake up uh, in the morning? You didn't think this was going to be interactive, huh? <laughs> I only have three pages of notes here, so I can't fill up an hour without having some. In 1848, you tough through until something falls off. Or <laughs> you tough through. But you didn't just sit by passively, right? You didn't just watch that arm get worse and worse or that cold develop into pneumonia or something. You do the best you can. Okay. So you do what you know you can do. Or you try some home remedies, yeah. Okay, so you try some things that have seemed to have worked in the past for the same kinds of problems you have, uh, or that somebody has told you worked. And there were things called uh, receipt books, recipe books, um, that you could follow, or domestic guides, like this one. This is Gunn's New Domestic Physician, or Home Book of Health. I love these full page titles, right? <laughs> A complete guide for families, pointing out in familiar and plain terms the causes, symptoms, treatment, and cure of the diseases incident to men, women, and children, blah, 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 medicinal plants, blah, 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 new remedies. Uh, John Gunn. This, the Gunn Domestic Guide, went through many, many uh, editions over the century. This one is 1862, but it continued on well into the late 19th and even into the early 20th century. So people could use this kind of thing. Um, how did you figure out what, what to look under here when you opened up this book? How did people think about illness in those days? It's body parts, it's symptoms, it's what ails you. It's not that you put together a whole group of symptoms and say it's this disease or that disease, the way we think of disease today. What you treated were the symptoms that were bothering you. So you would look up the symptom and take care of it and see what happened. Here's another one with a great picture. The annual family receipt book uh, the Useful Medical Advisor, or Everybody's Book, containing something for everyone, 1834. And the picture is kind of interesting, because uh, so dad is sitting there, presumably it's dad, reading the newspaper. Um, there's, I don't know if that's grandma holding, I guess what would be the, the sick kid or a baby, I guess that might be the sick kid. And, um, mom or wife is, is helping out, and there's also a servant, it appears, there. Um, so, kind of the family, and the home was the place where you took care of illnesses. So, you start using home remedies, or you consult a guidebook like these, and it doesn't work and you're still feeling sick. In fact, you're starting to feel sicker. What do you do? All of this assumes that you can read and have a book. Yes, that's very true. And also assumes that you are white and not enslaved and living in Pitt County. And that's a, an important point to make. And we can talk about, if you were enslaved, what would happen in that situation uh, as well. 
But, so let's talk about if you were a white person, a free person, could be African-American free person, although there were not many in, in Pitt County at that time. What did you do when you got sicker? Someone in the family went and got the doctor. Okay. So after the home remedies fail and you've asked, used all of grandma's recipes and uh, the neighbor and everybody else, then you would get in touch with the doctor. Okay. Yeah, you could. How, how much money you had, how long you wanted to stall off the inevitable. Um, but what was the trust level of uh, people for physicians? At, what was the success level of physicians at that time? Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, medicine was a, a very inexact art. And as I said, people were treating symptoms. So there really wasn't an understanding of disease the way we do today, of course, 100 years from now, people may look at some of the things we do and smile at, at what we do, but they didn't even know about germs, right, in the 1848. They didn't know about germ theory and all of that. Um, so you get in touch with the doctor, and you said that you find somebody in the family to go get the doctor. Yeah, how do you do that? Where's the doctor? Let's go back to being the physician again for a minute. Where are you during the day? Or maybe even at night? Judging by gun smoke. Drinking <laughs> <laughs> in the bar all day, right? You just have to send somebody on a horse to, to town. To town, sure. That would be easy, wouldn't it? You go to where the doctor's house was. I mean, that was the yeah. best okay. you could do. You could try and find the doctor's house, or sometimes they had offices. Um, and uh, that was true, that there were doctors uh, who had offices in town. But mostly, where were doctors if they were on duty? At somebody's house. At somebody's house. And how do you know where that is? And you're looking for the doctor. You don't know. Physicians were what? <laughs> Referral service. Referral service, right. <laughs> so you might, yeah. Of course, Pitt County's pretty big. And who knows, he might have gone past your house, may not have gone past your house on the way to visit some patients. So really, it's not, you don't really know where the doctor is. So what you could do is leave a message at the doctor's home or office, which means, back to your literacy, you have to write something, right? If you are um, literate, you might write something, you give it to a kid, a trustworthy kid, or if you own uh, a, a slave, we're talking about white people uh, right now, you might give it to that person who presumably couldn't read, um, but it didn't matter, it, still you would take it, leave it at the doctor's office. Or you might be able to track down the doctor and hand him the note, or tell him face to face, this is what's going on. This is the problem. So, here's a letter, um, 1815, to a physician uh, and in Albemarle County in Virginia, Charlottesville area. And I won't read all of it, but it talks about a, an enslaved girl who is sick and uh, has been complaining about some, some problems. And he describes the, um, the person who's writing it, I can't read it, um, describes what the symptoms are and says what the family has done to take care of this, uh, of this girl. And then uh, what, what do we do? Or please come, whatever the uh, request was. Another one of the letters to a doctor. Um, but I'm going to skip it and go. Uh, this is, I've got one that's typed out, so it's a whole lot easier. So this is, there's a whole series of uh, letters at University of Virginia um, Health Sciences Library. They have a nice manuscript collection. 
and they have a large collection of this Dr. James Carmichael's uh, correspondence from the uh, 19th century, pre-Civil War 19th century. And this guy lived in Fredericksburg. Uh, so here, dear sir, there is a little child here taken about 10 days since with a breaking out of watery blisters about her hips and legs. Okay, so description of what's going on, of the symptoms or the, what, what, what the problem seems to be. I gave her broken doses of salts and had the sores bathed in milk and water. The first have healed, but it still continues to break out much larger and thicker and seems to be getting over her body generally. So what do you learn from this? It's getting worse. Okay, it's getting worse and they've tried something, right? This is, these are the home remedies or whatever they think will take care of it. It is now attended with a constant fever. Three days ago, I gave her a dose of castor oil and yesterday morning, two grains of calomel, which is a mercury compound that in small doses um, is an emetic, makes you vomit in large doses, is a, uh, uh, what do I want to say? It gives you diarrhea, okay? Um, purgative, that's the word I was looking for. Which operated twice, which means, yeah, she had two bowel movements is what that operated twice means. She's not had a passage since. She's about nine months old and is very much reduced. Kind of scary. Today I am giving her the mixture you left to carry off Ann Carey's fever. So Sarah Selden is trying something that do the Dr. Carmichael left for Ann Carey, and Sarah Selden thinks that maybe this will work. We do that today, don't we? We give people medicines that we have in our medicine. No, we don't. Uh, <laughs> some people do. Nothing that I've given her seems to have been of the least service. I am now at a loss what remedy to apply. Yours respectfully. And P.S. The blisters, when they break, leave raw sores. Okay. So you're a doctor and you're visiting another patient and you, somebody finds you and hands you this letter. What do you do? What are your choices? Okay, so you, you could. could get over. Uh -huh. You've got a or you've got a bag. Yeah, nine months old. You've got to try something. You've either got to leave that patient or get, you know, give them something. Okay, so you've got you've got your your bag with you. With I'll show you a bag in a, in a little bit. And so you you might give that person some oral instructions, maybe written instructions, and some medicine, and send that person back. Or. You could jump on your horse or jump into your horse and buggy if you felt it was urgent enough and follow that uh, person back to the family, to Sarah Selden's home. So I'm now think in terms of the country doctor and what it, what it means to that doctor. He has to make or she has to make, it's mostly he's at this time, had to make a decision about what, what to do and how urgent it, it was. If you took care of it by letter and orally, that's like prescribing over the phone. It's, you have not seen this girl, this nine-month-old girl, and you're doing what you can based on the description that you've gotten from the family. Best you can do. So. And you hope if it's summer it's just poison ivy or something, then you would definitely tell them. Who knows? Yeah. So you as the country doctor are on the road a lot during that day, right? In those days, you went from house to house. You didn't have the patients come to you. So you're in your horse and buggy or on your uh, trusty steed uh, much of the day. OK, let's go back for a second now and let's talk about enslavement. If you were an enslaved person and you woke up feeling sick, this is off the topic, in a way, of the country doctor, but not quite. You wake up and you are enslaved and you feel sick. What do you do? There's usually somebody with a folk remedy to, init to initially start treating. Okay, so you could turn to other 
family members in your family and say, I, do, I feel badly, I want to take care of it. What's the risk of doing that as an enslaved person? Who should you report your illness to? The owner, right? Or an overseer, depending on how large, if you were in a small family situation, which was more common, a small farm, then you might, just, you might be just a family of enslaved people live, working for a white family, um, or maybe a couple of families working. Um, but at any rate, you, you, the rule would be that you don't take care of it yourself for all kinds of reasons that I'm not going to go into as far as trust and uh, understanding is concerned, and you would report it to the owner or the overseer or uh, somebody white, okay? If you don't do that, the risk is that you'll get in trouble, whatever that means on that farm or plantation. You'll, you'll get in trouble because you represent an investment to that family and the family wants, the white family wants you to survive and uh, keep their investment uh, sound. If you take care of, the, of yourself, then um, if it gets worse, then at some point you may have to report it and then again you'll, you'll be in trouble. So two things here. What if it's a child who's sick? As a parent, you would want to take care of your child, right? But as an enslaved person, you have to turn that child over to somebody else to take care of, of the child. That's tough. That's, I'm just trying to paint a little picture here of, of life at that time. So if you report it, you have to put yourself in the situation of having somebody take care of you whose medicine you may not trust or like, because medicine was very fluid. I don't mean liquid, but fluid. That is, there were lots of possibilities of how to take care of things. You may not uh, accept or want the kind of treatment that that physician is giving you. So you have to make a choice. Whose body is it? Do I own my own body, or do I have to turn my body over to somebody else? The physician comes in, let's keep on the enslaved part because we started, we're right there now. If you're enslaved and a physician comes to take care of you, so now you're the country doctor again, who's your patient? The owner. Well, the, the patient is still the enslaved person. Right. But the, client's the, the client is the owner. Who do you answer to? You as the physician answer to the owner. And so instead of having this dyad, as they call it, between doctor and patient, you've got a kind of a triad here between physician, patient, and whoever's paying, whoever owns the, the enslaved person. Uh, a different dynamic, something to, um, to think about. And as I say, it was a choice that enslaved people had to make. What do I do? When do I do it? And it was an awkward situation, I would think, for the physician. Maybe not. Maybe the physician was part of the slave system and very ingrained in and accepting of that this is the situation. Anyway. Just an interesting um, thought. Okay. So, here you are on your horse and buggy, or on your trusty steed. Notice the saddlebags there. So here's a saddlebag opened up. There are probably instruments in the other case. Another one. This one, uh, Dr. Copeland, James Copeland, this is the first article I ever wrote in my career. Um, and uh, this was back in the 70s. Uh, I came across this Dr. Copeland's records and his saddlebag up in uh, northern Virginia. 
Uh, and this was around 1900. He was in rural Virginia, and he was, that's how he got around, on his horse with his saddlebag. Or horse and buggy, and here you are out in Oklahoma, going through all kinds of things, heat and dust, flooded streams, snow maybe tomorrow, uh, who knows? And this is a buggy case, the, a buggy medicine case. These are all medicines. And there's Dr. Copeland again. And you'd get to the house. And this is a 1950 picture by Grandma Moses, but it still represents that same idea of the country doctor coming to the home. And now we're back in, we're still in the 18th, 19th century. Here's the doctor. This is a posed picture, but still it gives you some idea. There's the sick person, somebody taking care of the sick person, and the doctor who might spend the night there waiting for the fever to break or not break, trying to do what he can to care for this person. Time was an issue here. You, pay, you got uh, paid by the amount of time that you spent. So if you spend overnight, it's not as if you didn't get uh, some compensation for it, but still it's pretty exhausting to spend the night in somebody else's house, especially if you're not sleeping. Yeah, that's true, all that you can eat, so you get that. So how do you keep track of your patients? There were day books and ledgers. Day books were, were big books that you'd write down each time you visited a patient. You'd just keep it a, a, on, on a given day. You could look in a day book of a physician and see what that physician did, who that physician saw. Then it might be transferred to a big ledger book, and at the top of it, like this one, would be who the patient or the, the responsible party was, the uh, fiscally responsible party, in this case, Pierce Butler, fairly well-known uh, uh, 18th, 18th and 19th century guy, to this doctor. And the DR there stands for debtor, it owes, this person owes this doctor, Cyrus Dart. And you can see um, 1795, and it says, uh, so the doctor has transferred from his day book into this ledger book, the, the visits. And so what do you notice about what it says? What do you, what, this is the record. This is the, 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 the doctor's record. What do we know about what happened? Okay, so we do know that there was an amputation of an arm. Okay. Of a slave. Of a slave, right. Cost $8. Okay, he charged. At a house call charge. Yep. Okay. Look at the two of visit and dressing. Oh, uh, this is of the stump of the arm. Actually, this is, um, so this one is fairly specific because it tells you what the doctor went for. Very often, it would just be, you see the second, uh, third entry there for July 8th, to a visit, ditto, to your plantation uh, from wherever that is to whatever it is, 10 miles and the charge. Doesn't tell you what was wrong. Very often these records don't tell you what was wrong with the patient and what exactly the patient did, or the physician did. It might just say to prescription or to medicines and there'd be a charge next to it. So the medical record was much different from the medical record that we see in charts today. This is very bare bones. This was usually as much as you would find. You wouldn't find a patient history and a whole write-up. Part of it is that you knew your patients. They were your neighbors. You went to church with them. You lived among them. You bought supplies, sold things. If you were farming at the same time, uh, which often happened, you might be selling some of your crops to your patients. Um, so you see these folks at their prosperous times, at their poor times, at their healthy times, at their sick times. 
So you know the community. You live in that community. Um, and you might even stay a while. You might come and visit. You might get a letter, as, as um, this one doctor uh, that I read in Albemarle County did, that said, please bring the newspaper with you from town when you come to, my, to visit me. So what did that tell me? Or what does that tell you? This was a person who, because he went from place to place, he knew what was going on in the community, right? So he could tell, oh, I just visited, I'm not saying that he did, but he could say, I just visited such and such, and you know, you should hear about his cousin or her aunt or something like that. But the news of the, that person, that physician, knew what was going on in the families that he took care of. Uh, so again, this idea that physicians really lived in the community in which they practiced. How do you get paid? Oh, here's another. So how did the country doctor get paid? If they were lucky, they actually got money. Yeah. Okay. So the bill, as you saw, was for dollars and cents, that one that I showed you. Um, did you always get dollars and cents? No, you didn't. Uh, you could get it in kind. Uh, an apple pie, well, I hope it's more than that. Uh, but yeah, you'd get it in kind or real money. When did you get paid? If you're in Pitt County, you got paid when I put my tobacco in. Okay. When, you, you held me on account until the fall. Okay. Usually settling up time was around December, after harvest uh, in a rural community, after harvest when the crops have been brought in and sold even, so that you have some cash that you can pay the doctor with, or you have some crops that you can pay the doctor with. So you had to, if you were the physician, if you were the country doctor, you would have to finance yourself for the whole year without necessarily getting much money, uh, having much income over the course of the year. Okay. Um, so uh, that's a bit of a picture of the country doctor. I'm going to switch gears now and talk about change. Okay. So we've moved, let's move from the 19th century, early, mid, and maybe 1870s or so into the 1880s, 1890s, and then the early 20th century. What was going on in medicine? Lots of change. The 1870s is when Pasteur and Koch were doing, uh, talking about germs being in the air and causing illness. It wasn't always accepted by practitioners, uh, but over time, over the 1880s, 90s, and early 20th century, this idea that germs, these invisible things floating in the air, caused disease or that got on wounds, though that idea was being accepted. New bacteria were being discovered. This was a period when people, be, uh, physicians began to look under the microscope. It's kind of the period of science, the entry of science into medicine. So bacteriology, uh, micro, what we call microbiology now, was uh, becoming in fashion, you might say. If, if you look at the names of some of the bacteria, they're named after people. Uh, the discoverers, and there was competition to get yourself on a, uh, to name the bacteria after you, uh, if you could. Um, I'm not going to go into all of this, but uh, physical diagnosis, how do we find out? The big problem that physicians have always faced is how do we know what's going on inside the body without being able to open the body and look? So stethoscope. Scope is in that word stethoscope, right? But could you look with a stethoscope inside the body? No. It was to listen to the chest or the belly, but they called it a stethoscope. That was invented in the 18 teens in, in France, but it was one of the earliest diagnostic tools that went beyond hands and ears, uh, feel and touch and smell, but used an actual instrument 
Um, and then over the course of the 19th and into the 20th century, other tools of physical diagnosis got to uh, become popular, in, including uh, taking blood pressure. And physicians could then uh, visualize what was going on inside the body in a sense. Antisepsis, how do you take care of uh, germs when they invade the body? or if you can do it beforehand, as anti-sepsis sounds. Um, Joseph Lister did this work in the, actually the 1860s is when the idea came, uh, had the idea, but it wasn't until later in the 19th century that he began to use carbolic acid, phenol, as a, <coughs> a tool to kill bacteria. Uh, that idea was sort of accepted more and more um, as the uh, 19th century progressed and into the 20th. Hospitals became places where you could do safe surgery and what we now call the basic sciences became uh, understood. Science, the, the science of the body was better understood. The physiology of the body, the chemistry of the body, the pathology, looking at what bugs caused disease and what happened to the tissues and cells within the body, all of that. So the late 19th and early 20th century were really exciting times in medicine. I don't know why I put this in, but it's an interesting picture. Uh, horse and buggy days, I guess. Well, the hospitals on top of the furniture store, probably where you got your casket. Oh, jeez. Yes. Yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so think about the country doctor now, who'd been practicing for a number of years and um, change is occurring and either the country doctor has to go back to school or get refresher courses or how do you keep up with the new changes, with the new ideas that are uh, taking place. Um, so for some country doctors it was difficult to, to keep up. Two technological innovations spurred change in the country doctor. Actually, I should have. The first one is not the automobile. What would, the, what would it be? Can you guess what's in my mind? Uh, electricity would be one. Yeah, I guess that's it. But it's telephones, yeah. It's the telephone because that was instant communication. And that's late 19th, early 20th century. Some of the first adopters of telephones were physicians and hospitals. And then the automobile. Doctors loved to pose with their um, rigs, whether they were horses and buggies or uh, automobiles. So I've got several pictures here of doctors in their automobiles. JAMA in 1906 and 1910, no, 1910 and 1912 had special issues on the automobile and medicine with great pictures of doctors because it was, it was a new toy for doctors but a very useful one, not always reliable. One of the few pictures that I've uh, come across of an African-American physician in uh, an automobile. So what would the impact of the automobile and the telephone be on a rural doctor? What would it do to have automobiles around, either patients have them or you as a, a country doctor have one? How, how does that affect your practice? It's access. It's access. Okay, access to? Access to patients, access to, from patients to you. Okay. Okay, so access. Do you, Let's look at. You cut out that middle person that you had in the old days, the patient or a close family member can now call you and tell you what's going on. Okay. Instead of you having to write a letter or mm -hmm. in effect almost hearsay when you see to hear it from. Right. The so the, the telephone was a big. That was a big change because you could have direct contact. Automobile. If you think about, if I drew 
a circle here, and this is the practice area of a physician. And here's the practice area of another physician, horse and buggy days. Then you get the automobile, and the two can merge then, right? The access that one physician has to the patients of the other doc is greater. And so you get more competition. If you look in a medical directory of the uh, 1870s, you'll see a doctor in almost every town, every small town, every community. If you look in the early 20th century, there's still a lot of small town docs, but the number of docs in a town or the number of uh, towns where doctors are is decreased because access was easier. So you didn't have to live in the town where you practiced. You could live further away. You could even move to a large town. And if you moved to a large town, and there were several doctors who'd moved to a large town, you might even be able to say, I'm just going to take care of kids, because I can afford to do that. There are enough patients that I can learn only about kids, or mostly about kids, and be a pediatrician. Or I can just do surgery, and patients will come to me, and I can do surgery, and I can earn a living just doing surgery, because I've got a concentration of other docs who take care of other problems of, of people. So specialization was affected by, there were other reasons that specialization um, became a, a big in the early 20th century, but one of the reasons is that urbanization of physicians began to occur and doctors could live in towns. They didn't have to live out in the rural areas. So uh, there are other implications of the doctor, but Here's the doctor in his office in a town now. And I'm going to um, end with the idea of an emergency. So if you remember that, that baby who was very sick, that nine-month-old baby, and the doctor had to decide whether to hurry over to the uh, Sarah Selden's place and take care of that kid or not. If you fell off a tractor and broke an arm and you're miles from or hours, many hours away from having a doctor come and see you because the doctor is taking care of somebody else or whatever, what do you do? You take care of it yourself as best you can. If we have an accident and break an arm today, we rush to the doctor, right? Um, we're not as self-reliant as people were then. Because of necessity, people then had to take care of themselves to some extent. They may not do it as well as a physician, but it, they had to do something. So think about the idea of an emergency and time. So here's horse and buggy days and an emergency and think about it in a town even. So here's an ambulance. This is a kind of, I've put together a bunch of slides of ambulances. Here's an ambulance at a hospital. So ambulance finds there's somebody sick and has been, the ambulance has been called and so you uh, go and pick up person. Here's the hospital where you came from. You get on the hospital ambulance with your trusty bag. There you are again picking up the patient. And you hurry back to the hospital. You really hurry back to the hospital. Horsepower. And then you unload the patient. But think about that, the horse and buggy emergency versus the automobile emergency or the, the motorized ambulance emergency and how we've come to expect instant communication, instant access in, um, at least in urban areas, uh, rural areas. Now actually we have uh, East Care helicopters, so even there there's, there's a little bit more uh, of an easy access. So go back to our Dr. Siriani. Uh, Country doctors persisted through 
the 19th and into the 20th century. Um, I don't know, there are still country doctors. The Country Doctor Museum used to have an annual Country Doctor of the Year award. And there were many, many entrants. People from all around the country would write their stories or get their patients to write stories about how they're the best country doctor in the, in the country. So country doctor persisted, persists, I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna end there and ask for your thoughts about country doctors uh, today. And, and if you have questions, I'll entertain those too. So thanks for listening and participating in this back and forth. <laughs> Um, if you haven't signed in, please do so. And if you'd like to have, ask a question, I'd like to take this microphone to you so that we have both the question and the answer on the uh, tape. You mentioned earlier about the relationship that the country doctors, I'm, I'm descended from a few, so I, I know what happened. Um, the dark side of knowing your patients too well is the position it put the country doctor in in situations you know like we have today. I mean, uh, spouse abuse didn't start recently, you know, in all the other stuff, and and it must have been very difficult for that country doctor when she or he realized what the situation actually was in that family. Yeah, good. You point. know, you go out to that nine-month-old yeah. child and you find out it's been scalded, and and that's what's been happening. You know that kind of stuff, and and I wonder what kind of ethics were in place then. Was the physician at that time a little more allowed to go to the authorities, or um, it was really up to the physician to decide what to do? Um, and I don't even even know that authorities would, for example, spousal abuse would even accept that judgment and say that that's a bad thing. There were, I mean, spousal abuse, as you point out, has been going on for a long time and accepted in some cultures, even perhaps in, in American culture until recently. So, so it's a good question. I was thinking that physicians in general get to see, get to see people at their worst. They see the underbelly of, the, of humanity and of human nature uh, and that's even taking it a step further, that physicians step into, especially when they visit the home, they step into a, a situation that they don't know anything about. Uh, and it doesn't have to be abuse, it could be just poverty, uh, the way people live, uh, all kinds or, or, of things. Or it's what is often happened in the 19th century, you're, you're dealing with the long-term effects of alcoholism or something, you know, I can come to your mm -hmm. office and, you know, have a full bar back at the house, like you said, you walk in the house, you're going to see all of that. Okay. Um, the two, two situations I'd like you to comment on. One is the fact that a physician in a country area in sole practice uh, has no real time for a vacation or time off. Uh, um, in the 1950s, uh, a couple of years out of medical school, I did a locum tenens for such a doctor. I should say my wife and I did, because uh, she did a lot of the driving and organizing. But it was a wonderful insight into being a country doctor. Where was this? Uh, this was in England. In England, in, in the yeah, rural area. In Devon, in England. Uh -huh. Uh, but um, the, other, uh, the other aspect of that was that uh, you took an enormous risk uh, if you wanted to go away on vacation and had a locum tenens, unless you were lucky enough to uh, get a good one. The other, the other thing that um, I want to comment on is continuing medical education, which is so very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hate to say this, but we have the tort lawyers to thank for that. <laughs> to, to, that physicians keep up with, with the latest developments by going to CME courses and, uh, f for fear of being sued. Yeah. 
I don't, I don't know the, the history of CMEs. I don't know how far back they go. But so I don't. Well, I don't it made it very dangerous to be a single doctor in a rural area. Yes. Uh, if you might be sued if you make a mistake, you don't have x rays available. I, I was amazed when I saw this country doctor looking at an x ray. I wondered where's the x ray machine that he took the picture <laughs> in. Yeah. Uh, I just want to relay a um, um, a visit that I had uh, when I was working in southern Delaware. I was in a small town, um, and I was visiting a physician who was up in age, and his father was a physician. And this probably was at the beginning of the uh, of the 20th century. He had built a uh, a house for himself, and the second floor was essentially a four room hospital. And the town was, was fairly compact with the number of houses around a, a railroad station. And if uh, people uh, were sick and they came to his office, he would just house them upstairs. Wow. And he actually had a, um, I'm not sure what the uh, term is, but a, um, like a closet system for keeping medical supplies huh. uh, for each room that was specific to the room. And... Uh, had a whole system set up. Yeah, and yeah. and his wife was a uh, was a trained nurse, but it was this was an area that didn't have a didn't have a hospital for maybe thirty miles, but it was you know not everyone had a car <laughs> uh, back in that time. And I was wondering if um, a lot of hospitals in in smaller communities develop from physician offices. They at did. House. Yeah, physicians felt the need. Um, to have some kind of facility, or the town did, as with Dr. Siriani. The town built their, the hospital before they had a doctor and used it as a way to lure a physician to come. In the African-American medical world, in the era of segregation, black doctors couldn't practice in uh, hospitals in very often. Uh, they were not allowed to practice in hospitals, they had to leave their patients at the door, in the south primarily, not so much in the north. And so there were a lot of small southern black hospitals, um, like uh, up in uh, Tarboro, oh gosh, I can't think of his name, Quigless. Dr. Quigless has a, the building is still there, uh, where he built his own hospital because he couldn't admit patients to the white hospital, so to speak. <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Savitt. Um, Annie, from yes. I work at the Country Annie. Doctor oh, Museum. Hello, Annie. So thank you for including us in your talk. Um, if you all want to stop in, we're open Tuesday through Saturday. Um, if you can't get to Bailey, we have an exhibit in the Family Medicine Center on the second floor when you exit the elevators, and it's um, it's called tre Treasure Chess. And it has our buggy cases, our saddlebags, some of our apothecary chests, so it's not too far, right over there. Um, but I wanted to ask you, I've been reading about narrative medicine and kind of how patients tell their doctors kind of a, a story of how they became ill and they listen and they write. And I think that might be an element that country doctors already had in place when yeah. they would go and listen to That's their patients. That's a great point. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could comment on maybe a connection between those. Yeah, I don't, um, I, I, you've made it. Um, country doctors listen to stories um, in a way, perhaps, I, I don't know. I think of um, Dr. Mark came and visited me when I remember when I was a kid and I would imagine home visits by them, just by the very nature of them, allow for more story telling. But visiting the family, I mean, when you're visiting somebody's house and you have to spend hours there, as a 19th century country doctor would, then that would be a kind of form of early narrative medicine. And we think, you know, we've got something new now by getting the patient to tell the whole story when it was already going on. So that's a very good point. Um, Okay, I'll go to you next. I'm going to put Annie on the spot, and because we have some of the ledgers, we have uh, in the history collections, 
we have some of the ledgers from the Country Doctor Museum. And I remember that, the, that she told me that at least one person was paid in watermelon. Huh. Uh, two watermelons counted All for right. 50 cents. So it was a two watermelon visit, huh? Yes, and we have um, the ledgers we have on display at the museum. Um, the doctor makes note as like 10 pounds of ham at 35 cents a pound. They would do uh, work for the doctor at the doctor's farm. They would haul things for them to work on the roof, um, chicken eggs, and you name it, they would take it. That's great. So. Uh, and we've got some brochures for the Country Doctor Museum that I can uh, bring over here for people uh, who, for, no. who want to see it. Um, bef before we break up and for too many people leave, I just want to say that if you want to look at these, the Dr. Siriani pictures from Life Magazine 1948, they're on the web. And if you just type in Ernest Siriani, C E R I A N I, um, you can see all 39 of the pictures. Uh, they're really, as you can see, quite marvelous. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say, my father got paid in bushels of corn and green beans in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I was curious if your evidence said what happened to the nine-month-old baby, what Dr. Carmichael, or what he suggested uh, might happen or should be done. I yeah. don't know, and I but. It's on, that's all, the UVA website has mm -hmm. Dr. Carmichael's papers all transcribed. Oh. So you can oh, look yes. at them yourself if you go to the UVA Health Sciences Library, the William Mole Library, um, you can actually look it up. I should have thought of that though, that's a good, because I, I hate that one. I hate that when people, you know, tell you a story and then, then don't tell you what the ending is. In the very early days, when there weren't very many pharmacies, doctors had to compound and dispense yeah. their own medications. And you had to know quite a little bit Indeed. about yes. everything. The Country Doctor Museum has a big display on that. One of the things we're working on, uh, both for the Country Doctor Museum and also for the materials here, is getting them ready to go online. But we, we're not, nowhere as near as advanced on this as UVA um, and other places. And thanks to Annie and to Bayless Brooks um, who are working on some of this. So some of this, there are some interesting stories that we know we have, but we're not yet uh, online. Now, on the other hand, if you look at some of the things we do have online, we have things like the patent medicine trade cards. And you can, and since this is before the start of the Food, uh, Pure Food and Drug Act in about 1906, you can bet that they had, many of them had things like alcohol and morphine as major ingredients. When medicine was good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I would also like to add to Melissa's what we have over in Joiner Special Collections. We also have collections of doctors' uh, uh, letters for the uh, and and documents for the 19th century. S they're beginning to put more of those online, so we do have some of those that have been digitized as well. Great. Yeah. I, I just wanted to mention that. Um, my experiences with uh, the, those those manuals or those books, you know, for the home, mm -hmm. uh, I came across one on a flea market in in rural Burgall. It was a very very poor community, and there was a, an 1888 book called Doctor Brown's Recipes and Information for Everybody. It's mostly medical cures, things, home remedies, and uh, but it was very technical. And I took it back to my grandmother's house, and I sat in the backyard with her and her oldest daughter, my aunt Marie. And I would ask them something. I'd turn, just turn the book and ask them something about how do you treat this. And she would tell me what was in that book. So that, She knew it. That woman knew it. Uh -huh. And she, I, I was amazed at the amount of information that she must have gathered simply because she had to. So, That's great. And, and you can also get a copy of that, a reprint on Amazon, by the way. I saw it on there. <laughs> Okay, I think we're done. As I said, we've got uh, brochures on the Country Doctor Museum. I, they didn't pay me to plug the Country Doctor <laughs> Museum. <laughs> but, th but thank you, to Todd. <laughs>
Thank you. Thanks for staying.